This time on Pedalbox, against all odds, we get our instrument cluster and some electronics powered up. But they are a bit angry at us. So you might be wondering why we've got the instrument cluster outside of the car kind of draped in on this harness the way it is right now. And honestly, the reason is twofold. One, we've got a sensor that we installed last episode, that brake fluid warning level sensor that we really need to test. That's a key thing for the IVA. We're not allowed this car running without that sensor working, without the indicator for it working. So to test that, we need the instrument cluster running because that knows what way around it's supposed to work. Um, like the original switch. The other half of the reason is because right now we've done enough testing and enough debugging on the rest of the wiring harness that we're actually kind of confident we can power this thing up and have it work without like letting any magic smoke out or blowing anything up anywhere. So it's a pretty big step for us and it's one of the major, major milestones we've been working toward on all of our recent episodes with all of this wiring. So that's right, this is another episode on wiring and electronics, and I am kind of sorry for putting you through it, but at least this time we do have an actual win to show for it, which is an instrument cluster that admittedly is very angry because a lot of sensors it's expecting to talk to aren't there, nor is the ECU, nor is the immobilizer system, but it does at least work. We do have indicators on it, and it is starting to behave properly. Now, although there's quite a lot going on here, we do have obviously the entire wiring loom splayed out in front of me. It's actually a pretty simple test setup. We've got a little battery here that we're gonna install in the back one day. I've got a live from it running directly into our fuse box that's just sat kind of pressed up against one of the main power bars. So that gives us permanent live. And then for our switch live, I've got a special key here that goes into the connector that used to plug in to the ignition barrel. So when I pop that jumper wire across there, it bridges the permanent into the switch live exactly the same way as the key itself would. And then the instrument cluster starts complaining at me. Now the reasons the instrument cluster is angry at us are many. It turns out there are checks in there for basically every vital fluid. It obviously knows about fuel and coolant. Uh, it also knows about oil level. So it's throwing alerts at us for oil level, fuel level, coolant level, uh, an ABS system failure. And also there's another one I'm trying to remember. Also it's complaining at us for something that looks immobilizer related. There's like a little car key icon on there that neither of us have ever seen before in any of these. Although granted, neither of us ever attempted to hotwire an Audi A3 or TT. So now we've got the instrument cluster up and running. We're gonna connect our float. I'm holding the float up now. So it's uh, effectively the switch is open, uh, which is simulating like everything's fine. There's lots of fluid in the system. And now if I hold it the right way up and I just drop our float, so now we've run out of brake fluid. It's beeping. Is that beeping for the right alert? Excellent, Aid's nodding at me from off camera. So we have got a low brake fluid alert that's just come up on the display. Now apparently we're on a bit of a roll because we've managed to find our handbrake sensor by accident as well while looking for a wire to extend the brake, brake level sensor. So we're gonna see if we can get this wired in as well. Now I might have cursed us by saying we kept winning earlier because you now join us more than two hours later and you'll notice this is still not installed and I still have the wires in my hand. We did get a bit screwed by kind of an inaccuracy or I guess you could call it an omission in the wiring diagram we've got. Out of the switch here, we've got a brown cable with a red stripe on it that goes to the instrument cluster for the indicator light. So we go, okay, cool. Well, if it's a brown and red cable on the green connector on the instrument cluster, we'll follow it from the green connector back. We'll cut it and we'll splice into it. So we did that and um, it didn't work. And it turns out that the brown and red cable coming out of that connector is actually wired to a completely different pin, totally unrelated to the handbrake switch. When we looked up the pin that this is supposed to connect to, we pulled the connector housing apart and followed that wire back. It turns out that somewhere in the wiring harness, this cable, brown with red, becomes brown with red with yellow dots on it. And that cable is the one that's going into the right pin on the connector. So we've traced that back eventually. It took us quite a while to figure out what was going on because we just kind of doubted our own sanity. And we did eventually find it. So now we're gonna splice this brown and red cable into the brown, red and yellow and see if our indicator works on the dash. After a successful few minutes digging through the big box of wires that we previously removed from the car so we can put some of them back in the car again, we have now got a handbrake switch fully wired. So if I hold this up to our dashboard here, press and release the plunger a few times, you can see our indicator light works properly. So this just clips on to the side of the handbrake lever like so. Just kind of, there we go. And now we have a parking brake light. 
But while we've been working in the fuse box over here, we decided to run the power that our heater box needs. So we ran a new power line, which runs down into our control switch. We've got three wires coming out the back, connected to two, three, and four. We don't have four modes, so there's no real point in having all of them. So we've gone with zero, two, three, and four. They run down into the heater box. And in theory, if Chris puts power into the fuse box now, yep. and I put it on two, it should work. And if I open up that vent, that blows nicely. Obviously that one's not connected. That one's working. They're all working quite nicely. And the butterfly valve actually seals reasonably well. It's not completely perfect, but that's also not gonna be a problem. So that will still help direct more of the air to other locations. And then medium and high, that all works is very, very pleasing. The other part of this that we can test is the footwell vent because we didn't have the piece printed, but now we have. So we've printed up this little adapter, 50 mil on the top, and this just slides over this vent down here, which fits quite nicely. So I'm gonna put that on two. So this is low speed. Let's see what it does when it powers up. That actually blows reasonably well. And it blows better, obviously, the more vents you close off. So if you just want footwell, that blows quite strongly. And better than that, the controls also work. And you can close it off as well, which then directs more air to all of the other vents. Perfect. I'm very pleased. So all we need to do is tie up some of these pipes into better locations. We really want this one held at the top here, but we need to work out what's happening with these fill pipes. We were gonna use some big 5 8 inch tube or uh, 5 8 inch flex all the way from the hard lines down here all the way up into this. But I think doing that is gonna be more problematic because we're not gonna have quite enough room to get this around. So we're gonna raid the box of hoses, find some 90 degree pieces and build something that will join those two sections up. And with that, the heat matrix is plumbed for water and it's almost completely plumbed for the airflow as well. We're just waiting on one more bracket printing upstairs, but we've got everything else in. Obviously this one's not connected up because the dash panel isn't on, but we've removed quite a lot of this 5 8 inch rubber hose from the water side of the heater matrix. It was just a little too big to go onto these plastic fittings. We couldn't quite compact them down enough with the Jubilee fittings uh, and really get a good watertight seal. So we've replaced out this end with some molded hoses from our big box of hose from all the, the uh, donor cars that we've stripped. And we put a bulkhead fitting down here, which has a step up to go from 5 eighths that fits this to uh, about 15 mil, which is what these pipes seem to be. So there's just that little discrepancy. But other than that, this is now all in, which is really, really good. Obviously we've got the heater controls in here, just waiting a printed panel to go on there. But otherwise, this is looking a lot tidier than it was even about an hour ago. Well, that is another huge step towards getting this thing able to be tested and run under its own power once we get a not broken ECU. So thank you very much for watching. If you've made it this far through all of our wiring episodes and you've been watching from the beginning, we are very sorry that has been such a huge chunk of them and we should have probably got a lot of this done earlier. If you would like to support us in building this, you can go to patreon.com forward slash pedal box show where you can support us from a dollar a month. And if you do want to buy some merch like this t-shirt I am actually wearing, you can go to shop.pedalbox.com show where you'll also get discount if you're a patron depending on the tier of your membership. Thanks very much for watching once again. I apologize because there's been so much wiring lately. There is still a little bit more to do. There is some more fabrication things that we need to get on with as well and we need to fix a few fitment issues. So we'll get on with that in another episode. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.